Have you ever considered what it is to be a Canadian? What is unique to being a Canadian citizen uh, other than your ID card and your birth certificate? Well, in 2012, there was a study that was done and it asked Canadians that very question. What makes a good citizen? You really wouldn't be that surprised by the answers though. I'm not gonna share them all. They were, they were pretty vague. They were like obeys laws, votes in elections, adopts Canadian values, which that could mean a whole lot of things, um, pays their taxes, shows tolerance, etc. cetera, those, those types of things. Nothing really too mind-blowing, nothing really unique to Canadians really on that list. And they also had a section where they asked, what makes you feel like a good Canadian citizen? Which is probably the better question to ask in our touchy-feely, hypersensitive culture. But, but the answers were pretty much the same in the top 10. Um, I will say this though, the religious tolerance and acceptance was pushed a little lower on that scale, believe it or not. And I, I did ask this question to a few people this week as well. And they gave me actually some at least distinct Canadian answers like loves hockey or likes being polite. But in general, every answer that was given in those lists really could have been included in most countries' um, good citizen list. Um, and despite the appearance of them being deeply foundational, in practice, many of these things are, are rather shallow and not truly deeply seated virtues. Now, keep in mind, this poll was done in, in 2012, pre-COVID. Um, this past year and a half has shown us a lot about ourselves, hasn't it? It's shown us that Canadian attitudes have changed somewhat with stay home and stay safe becoming a virtue. Um, and uh, love your neighbor as yourself being demoted to merely just don't get anyone sick, especially grandma. Don't get grandma sick. In general, many Canadians have proven that critical thinking and discernment are not all that important. Whether the, whatever the government says, whatever mainstream media says, that is the gospel truth. And though we are Canadian, what makes us so has shifted as our circumstances have shifted. And we've seen that. Citizenship does, however, still carry with it rights and freedoms that we should fight for, as well as responsibilities. Our citizenship in God's kingdom, though, you can see where I'm going now, carries with it benefits and privileges, freedom and responsibilities, but these do not change or shift depending on our local climate or our circumstances or certainly our feelings because they are firmly rooted in an unchanging God and in his unchanging word. So being Canadian while being a privilege, and it is, on its own doesn't really give you a distinct calling or purpose. Being a citizen of Christ's kingdom though, not only gives us an identity based on an immovable foundation, the gospel in Jesus Christ, but it also gives us purpose to live out that gospel and make disciples for God's glory. Mission and purpose, identity and purpose, these are two very important things. And compared to our heavenly citizenship then, our earthly citizenship seems more of a, an, a loose affiliation or a geographical kinship. So what does God's word say about our heavenly citizenship and how we should live in light of it in a way worthy of it? Well, it has a lot to say about that, but we're gonna focus in on one passage in Philippians, Philippians uh, chapter one, verses 20, 27 to 30, because it addresses this question for us. It's the apostle Paul speaking to the church in Philippi. So follow along, starting on uh, verse 27. It says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a, a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The Bible tells us that 
all who have been saved by grace are citizens of a greater kingdom, Christ's eternal kingdom, radically united in the gospel, fearless against opposition and willing to embrace suffering for the sake of Christ. Paul here in this passage, he's speaking to the Philippian church. Philippi was a Roman colony in Macedonia. It was, it was colonized after the battle of Philippi in 42 BC by Roman soldiers from that, that battle. In fact, both sides were actually Romans in that battle. Citizens would have enjoyed the benefits and privileges of being a Roman colony like tax exemption. They were governed under the municipal law of Rome as a, a miniature Rome. And what characterized this citizenship would have been a complete allegiance and loyalty to Rome. Worship of pagan gods, worship of the Roman emperor when there was one. And certainly there was a great civic pride. They were proud. And for those who were citizens, their identity and their lifestyle were wrapped up in these very things. But for us, in Philippians 3, verse 20, Paul writes, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the very first thing that we need to reconcile in all of this is that our primary citizenship is in the kingdom of God. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel can simply be translated, live as good citizens of the gospel of Christ. This, we know, creates a tension in our lives, though. Um, as our, our allegiance to Christ can put us in direct conflict with our earthly citizenship. But what makes a worthy citizen of Christ's kingdom? What should a life that has been made worthy of that citizenship look like? That's a better question. What about when our kingdom citizenship pits us against our earthly citizenship? And I think that's the question that we all have. How do we respond then? Some Philippian believers were likely lower class, possibly in servitude, while others were citizens of Rome, possibly veterans of the Roman army of which they had declared their allegiance. Some, no doubt, had earned their citizenship. As such, many had privileges that others would have only dreamed of, and this status would have been a big deal to them. They would have had a pride in it. But Paul here is reminding them, no matter what their station in life, that they are to give their primary allegiance to another kingdom, and identify with that kingdom above all else, a citizenship that they didn't earn or could earn. And the Bible is asking us to do that very same thing. So let me ask you this. Do you primarily identify as a Canadian or as a Christian? It's a good question. Being a good Canadian obviously doesn't mean that we'll be good Christians, but being a good Christian should mean that we are the best of Canadians at least when it comes to following God's moral laws and values and conduct, which we know is good for our society. Our culture can very much mirror that of Philippi's. Idolatry, sexual immorality, pride, self-sufficiency, and so on. Different time, different location, but all the same sin. But we, Christians, we are called to live not as the world does, but as those who have been transferred from one kingdom to another kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So there really are only two kingdoms. There's a lot of nations, a lot of citizenships, but there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And God has given us a new identity. He's moved us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. And notice it says, he has delivered us. This was begun and completed for us, not by us. This year, I'm sure you all know it's an, Olymp an Olympic year. Um, I believe it started this week even. So usually in an Olympic year, there's a greater pride of citizenship than other years. Athletes march under the flag of their country to bring glory to their names, to their fellow countrymen, and certainly to their nation as a whole. And when they win a medal, the whole country celebrates and exalts the one who won that medal. As Christians, we too should be marching under the flag of our King and Savior and bring glory and honor to him 
with how we live every year. As those saved by grace through faith alone, we are never exalted, but God is in all that we do. As we live as worthy kingdom citizens, those whom have been made worthy by Christ. So what exactly does this look like? Well, Paul continues in verse 27 to say, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So a citizen of the kingdom of Christ, and this is our first point, and it's probably the easiest of all three points. They get more difficult as we go. The first point is this. A citizen of Christ's kingdom has a radical unity with other Christians. Paul is saying, you, Christian, are united, so act like it. You have a new identity. You have a mission. You have a purpose. And you have a way to fulfill those things. He's writing from prison. He's not with them, but he knows that this type of unity, this type of bond will be clearly evident to all, and he desires to be united with them in this way. And this is a unity that's not based on geography, ethnicity, skin color, class, family, income, position in life, or occupation. I feel like we're running out of things. So what's left? Well, Paul identifies this unity for us here. And this is not some mile-wide, inch-deep unity that so many people are after. What binds us together is the gospel and the Holy Spirit on one side and mission and purpose on the other. It's like the most powerful two-part epoxy that exists. Um, when, When these two sides are mixed together, we are firmly cemented together in unity. We're able to stand firm. We're able to strive together in unity for God's glory. And this is an act of faith. It's something we're called to live out together as believers. How do we do that? Well, Paul gives us a couple ways here. First, he says we stand firm in one spirit with one mind. We are united in Christ, in the Holy Spirit who is in us. It's the person of the Holy Spirit that unites us in the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the main thing. If we lose focus on these, it's impossible to have any true unity. And once the focus is moved from Christ and the cross to anything else, we'll find that we have a lot to disagree on. We've seen that in the church in Canada. But we are to be united in Christ, in his word, and in the gospel that has saved us. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 6, we read, and this is Paul writing again, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So in this, we are commanded to stand firm. And that's a military term, meaning to hold your ground. To stand firm in one spirit would mean to stand our ground firmly on God's word in the Holy Spirit. The foundational truth that all true believers count as not just true, but truth is the Bible. It's absolutely trustworthy because it's God's word. And within its pages is our declaration of independence from the world, but our dependence on God. It includes the very laws that govern our our thoughts and our actions. There are no legal loopholes in it, but there is a lot of misinterpretations. But the word itself is perfect and not only able to direct us and to guide us, which is great, but it's also able to transform us, which is even better through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are a people of the book, the source of, of our unity is the Holy Spirit who gives us the strength to stand and stay focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, for in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free. All were made to drink of one spirit in unity. 
When I was in grade school, we used to play this game at recess called Red Rover. Anybody here play Red Rover? There's a few that are not as young as others, I guess. Um, might have been before some of your time. Well, I, it's probably been banned anyways. It was a little dangerous. Well, I, well okay, we played on asphalt, so it was even more dangerous. But the, the game was pretty simple. It consisted of two teams. I was going to say we could do that. No, we're not going to. It consists of two teams, and each team would line up across from each other, and they would, they would grab hands. You guys know what I'm talking about, some of you. They would grasp hands as firmly as they could, or they'd link arms, whatever it was. And then they would yell out to the other team, Red Rover, Red Rover, Adam, come over. And then Adam would leave his team and bolt. He would run as hard as he could at you, and he would try and bust through those hands. You had to squeeze tight, but he would try. And if he got through, he could take one of you, one of the two that he broke through, back to his team. But if he didn't, he had to join your team. It was tough to bust through. We learned, you learned, we learned a lesson as kids that we had to work together and, and stand firm together. Um, I think it was more fun to break through, though. Um, but it was difficult. You had to run with all your might and force to break through because the other team was linked together tightly. And it made a, a great defense. And this is somewhat similar, believe it or not, to what Paul is getting at here. We, we link together. We stand firm together. We hold our ground in the unity of the gospel. And then standing firm, the second point, we strive together with one mind for the faith of the gospel. On our own, we'll struggle to do anything. But together, we're stronger. We're, we're called here to strive together with one mind, a mind that is focused, again, on, on the gospel, the faith of the gospel, the very thing that actually unites us under the flag of Christ as citizens. We have mission, and we have purpose, and we must strive together in those. An ancient army was only formidable when its soldiers were in formation. They were linked together. They would keep each other from being exposed using their shields to attack from the enemy. And then they would push forward together against the opposing force with one united purpose. Each soldier had to be united in the same task. They had to be well-trained. They had to be disciplined. They had to be focused. They had to be moving as a single unit. And if we look back over this last year and a half, as we fought to keep the church open, we did so because we know we are stronger together. Not, a, not only has God, God called us to gather, but we're stronger when we do. And God has made his church to be that way. We don't gather as individuals, each worshiping God in our own way. Rather, we come together to exalt Christ with one voice, with one purpose, encouraging one another forward on mission and redirecting each other's focus on Christ. And it's that redirection that's so important. I'd heard an analogy uh, at a worship conference a few years ago that I remind myself of and the worship team of, and that's this idea that we are, we are tour guides. So when a tour guide takes you to the Grand Canyon, all eyes are directed on the, the beauty of the canyon. Nobody cares what the tour guide looks like. Nobody. Who cares? There's something way better to look at. And we, when we come together as a church, we're, we're, we're actually refocusing one another's attention on Christ. We do this for one another when we gather together in this unique way. We have the glory of the cross and the beauty of our God to point to as we encounter his presence in a unique and amazing way, gathering together in worship. And you know that because you're here. And this is something to fight for. This is something to be united in. This is something that builds our confidence. It builds our faith. It binds us together as kingdom citizens so that we can strive together in a world that is directly opposed to us because of the offensiveness of the gospel that has saved us. We are radically united in this. And when we are, we're stronger. We have courage. We have focus. We're not easily shaken. We're not easily moved. And we are an offense. Why? Because the gospel is offensive to a lost and dying world that doesn't want to hear it. Paul goes on to add here, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. 
This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. You will have opponents who hate you. Why? Because of the gospel. It tells us we're sinners. It tells us we're hopeless. We need a savior. Therefore, we who are united in that gospel are open to attack from the enemy, from Satan, the ruler of this world, though under the sovereignty of God. And those who are on his side, whether they realize it or not. So we need to be courageous and confident against the inevitable attacks that will come against the opposition, but not confident in ourselves, but in God who fights for us and has also won the battle. We sang about it this morning, won the battle and defeated the enemy once for all on the cross and in the resurrection. So a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven has this radical unity with other believers, standing firm in their faith, striving together. And our second point is a fearless witness. You are not terrified by those who oppose you. We don't cower in fear of opposition or public opinion or of losing or anything that this world has to offer, including our very lives. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God gave us, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So you're not to be ruled by fear. If you are, are you really trusting in God? Do you actually believe that he is sovereign, that he is good? Now, I'm not saying that we're not tempted to fear. We are. We're all tempted at times to be afraid. For, but God's given us a lot of reason not to be afraid. And verse after verse telling us, don't be afraid. Because God is the one who's always in control. He is dangerous to those who oppose him. But a shelter, a safe haven for those who seek refuge in him. The temptation to fear can create an opportunity for faith then. It can be redemptive if it drives us to seek and to trust God. We can move from fear to faith as we learn to trust in him more and more. Fear in anything other than God is a sign of independence and self-protection and self-interest. It's a misplaced focus on our temporal weakness and our, and our circumstances. Fear of the opposition places the opposition above God. There's a writer, Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if any of you have read her. She, she wrote a book called The Hiding Place, among, among other books. But her and her family helped, the, helped Jews escape from the Netherlands in World War II during the Nazi occupation and uh, she herself, she was imprisoned in a concentration camp, but survived to write about it. But she says this, this, this beautiful, simple thing. She says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. I agree. If you look within, you'll be depressed. I agree. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Faith concentrates the mind on Christ. It's a sign of utter dependence on God. Faith sees the weakness, but in light of God's strength. Faith sees the eternal, not the temporal, and leads us into worship, which is our only right response. For Christians, maturity is, is gauged by a growing childlike trust in the one that we call Father and in the Son who is paid the wages of our sin and covered us in his righteousness. And then in the spirit who is in all believers, the same spirit that actually raised Christ from the dead. Ultimately, our main opposition is the devil and his forces. And the warfare that we are engaged in is a spiritual warfare, but it's happening in our physical world at this time. And its forces are made up of those who oppose Christ whether they realize it or not, including a majority of people, including most of the media, including unjust and immoral governments and organizations that we know of that have radically sinful agendas. But get this, they are not united like we are. 
Amen. They may fight together against a common enemy at times, but self-interest and glory are what they're really after. That's what rules their heart. Why? Because their father, the devil, was after that very same thing. He He wanted glory. He wants glory. His desire is to be the exalted one, and we know that he's not, nor will he ever be. And he is already lost. Colossians 2.15 reminds us of this, saying, He, Christ, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So you don't fear the enemy. Why? Because you are united with Christ. And you are part of an army with the greatest, most trustworthy commander and king who has already defeated the enemy on your behalf. We have to remember this, and we have to remind each other of this all the time as God's word reminds us of it. And when we do so, we we demonstrate something. We demonstrate a resurrection hope that is for all who have placed their faith in Christ alone for their salvation. But when we stay in fear and when we cower, we are denying that hope. And we're denying the power and sovereignty of God. But consider this, though. If you do not face any opposition in this life, you need to ask yourself, am I actually standing up as a witness for Christ? Are you on mission? The opposition only truly comes when the world is made aware of your allegiance to Christ and our mission to glorify him by making disciples. That's when the opposition comes. Many churches and many Christians through this last year and a half have shown that they fear a virus and appearing unloving to their neighbors more than they do God. In doing so, they've aligned themselves with those who who desire to suppress the church and the very gospel that calls sinners to repentance and faith in true kindness and in true love. We will not be opposed by the world if we try and blend into it. If our morality, if our lifestyle, if our goals, if our words and our actions line up with and agree with the world's, then who are we really? If the world applauds you and your church all the time, then you need to wonder if your church is actually following the word of God. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Romans 12.2 reminds us to not be conformed to this world. But here's a a clincher. Here's a clinching verse. John 15.19, and this is Jesus talking. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. You're not of the world. We're guaranteed that the world will hate us. Why? Because it hates Christ. Are you ready for that? Are you expecting that? But at the same time, we're told not to be frightened in anything by our opponents, anything. Our faith actually sends a message to our world then and to one another. It demonstrates two very important things. And Paul lays that out for us. First, it's a clear sign to them that them is all that oppose Christ, including Satan and his army. It is a clear sign to them of their destruction. Our fearless faith in the midst of opposition shows those who oppose Christ and his followers that they are doomed that they have lost. The proof of their destruction is in the radical unity of the church and the fearlessness of the church as we strive together in the gospel. Nothing drives a bully more nuts when the person they're trying to bully is not afraid of them. It weakens them. It deflates them. It actually terrifies them. The second thing that it demonstrates, it's a clear sign of our salvation from God. As we strive together in unity under the banner of Christ, our assurance grows. We've seen that in our own church, haven't we, this year? That as we've stood up in the face of tyranny, that we've grown together in unity and in faith. Our church hasn't shrunk. 
Our resolve has increased as we strive together. The example set for us in fearlessly standing against tyranny and injustice and immorality and for the sovereignty of Christ over his church by those like Pastor James Coates, Pastor Tim Stevens, and certainly Pastor Aaron Rock. All who have been willing to take fines and jail time, public humiliation and scrutiny, this has demonstrated to us a clear sign of the salvation to God, of God, which has helped strengthen many of us, hasn't it? And no doubt this has driven our bullies absolutely insane. Every generation, no doubt, has had the, the chance to, to demonstrate this very thing because Christ has always been opposed. But what a privilege it's been to be a part of that here together in this church in this city, in this time. So a good kingdom citizen has a radical unity with other believers, is ruled by faith, not by fear. And then our third point, and this is one of the tougher ones, accept suffering as a gift. You heard me right. That is a tough one. But the key word, actually, I'll read what Paul says first. He frames it up for us in this passage. Then it'll make sense. He says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So the key word in here is granted. Suffering is not just something that we are promised, that we have to merely endure. It certainly is something that we're promised and that shouldn't take us by surprise, as it says in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But there's much more to our suffering. It's not just expected, but it is also redemptive, and it is good. Paul speaks both of our salvation and our suffering in the same light in this passage, as something that's granted to us, that's gifted to us, not to be despised or seen as punishment, but rather as a special privilege for those who are kingdom citizens. And I got to admit, that is a tough one for me. That's not easy to swallow. And why do we struggle so much with a redemptive view of suffering? Well, I think, well, I'm Canadian. As Canadians, we're not accustomed to suffering persecution. We've never had to stand up for our rights or certainly fight for our own freedom at least until more recently. I think only now some of us can, can actually understand what that means and what it can mean to be persecuted for our faith, even though for most of us, it's light. For most of us, it, it's social media backlash if we post something. It's, or we, it might cost us a friend or two on Facebook, probably someone we've never even met. That's all it costs for now anyway. But if we're not willing to be persecuted on this light, easy level, what about when things get ramped up? What about when persecution becomes greater? Some already have faced jail time, fines, demotions at work, and some of you are in this room right now. If something isn't of value to us, we wouldn't suffer for it. And we certainly wouldn't see anything redemptive in that suffering, let alone see it as a gift that's granted to us in the same way our salvation is granted to us, which is how Paul refers to it here and which is how he has experienced it to be. Paul and the apostles, they were expert in this. Why? Because their savior was. First Peter 4 continues with, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Jesus himself referred to as a suffering servant says in Luke 6, 22 and 23, blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. 
rejoice in that day and leap for joy. That was my leap. (laughs) For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. That seems pretty strange. But it isn't, and it shouldn't be for the citizen of heaven. And it shouldn't be for you. And it shouldn't be for me. Why? Because suffering produces in us and for us something that nothing else can. Suffering brings heavenly reward, as we read. Suffering unites us in a unique way with Christ as we share in his sufferings. Suffering unites the church. Suffering gives us a laser focus on Christ. Suffering strengthens our faith, and it sanctifies us. James 1, 2 to 4 explains a little about how that works. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering increases our desire for Christ's return. Let's face it, it's usually in our darkest moments that we we say fervently and with passion, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's not to say that as Christians, we don't have this, this regular sense of the need for Christ's return, nor look forward to it. But I imagine few of us have that same urgent prayer on the way to vacation or on the way to the golf course, at least until maybe the ninth hole when things change for you and, and your game starts to tank. And I remember myself praying the opposite as I waited for my wedding day. My prayer was more like, Lord, just, can you just wait until after the honeymoon? <laughs> but seriously, though, when the pressure's on and we're facing battle against battle against those who oppose us because we are Christians, we definitely become more eternally minded, don't we? And we look up more for Christ's return. And then suffering is a witness to our world. How we endure suffering is one of the greatest evidences of our faith. If someone's doubting whether you truly believe what you say you believe, how you endure persecution and suffering stamps that for them, shows them that you are a person of faith. In truth, suffering persecution for the sake of the gospel has far greater benefits than we could ever know until we go through it. Then we begin to know. Our attitude has a tremendous impact on our audience. Responding to suffering this way is not natural. It's supernatural. It's by God's grace. And throughout the Bible and history, we see the impact suffering has had on the one suffering, the one inflicting that suffering, and the onlooker, the witness to it. Here's a a few biblical examples of that. At the crucifixion of Jesus Matthew 27, 54, it says, So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Christ's suffering, along with all that was going on, caused the very ones who crucified him to be the first to admit he is who he says he is. And in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles were arrested for preaching the gospel, and they were thrown in public prison by the high priest. And God miraculously sets them free, and they go right back to the temple to preach. Then they get arrested again. And this time, they're beaten and released and told not to go back to the temple to preach. Well, you can get, they went right back at it. And this is what's recorded for us in Acts 5, 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They rejoiced. Can you imagine that? They rejoiced. And later in Acts chapter 16, Paul, again imprisoned. He's in prison a lot. This time with Silas in Philippi. And it says, when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. So they beat them first, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. What comes next? About midnight, Paul and Silas 
were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were listening to them. Their witness under this persecution was a light in a very dark place. It doesn't get much darker than a prison. In fact, the jailer came to faith. After an earthquake broke open the cells and Paul and Silas refused to run away, he had witnessed much in the suffering of Paul and in Silas, enough to cause him to believe that there was something genuine and real about their faith, about their God, enough so that he wanted that same faith. A few weeks ago, I watched a movie called Silence. I don't know if you've ever watched that. It's, it's, it takes place in 17th century Japan, and it follows two Portuguese priests or missionaries as they, as they go to Japan to look for their missing mentor. But what they find when they, when they get there are, are groups of Japanese Christians who've been forced to worship underground in their villages due to intense persecution, like serious intense persecution, severe torture, execution of those just who profess to be Christians. And it was, it was difficult to watch in this movie. Many faced crucifixion, beheading, drownings, being burned alive, all signs of a desperate regime that was terrified of this outlawed faith. When the ruling class found that these Christians weren't afraid of death or persecution, they kept going. But the Christians still weren't afraid. They were so convinced of their heavenly citizenship that they didn't fear death. They knew that death was the passageway to paradise, to being with Christ, to being with the one who had actually suffered and died for their salvation. So they weren't afraid. They were okay with suffering. Not that they were looking forward to it but they endured it in worship, with worship. The Apostle Paul, earlier in, in 1 Philippians, writing from prison, says in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul here, he's sharing the redemptive, God-glorifying purpose of his suffering. His imprisonment had served to advance the gospel to all, including his captors, the imperial guard, and brought a new boldness to the brothers who were witness to it. And no doubt, He's writing this to encourage the Philippian believers. But he's also writing to encourage us. Suffering for Christ has value and it has purpose. And when we're willing to face persecution, willing to face death or merely public humiliation or mistreatment or a job loss or financial distress, for the sake of the gospel, for God's glory, not only does it lead to deeper faith and worship, knowing that we're sharing in and united with Christ in his suffering. But we know that the, the impact on those who are witness to it is tremendous. For the believer, witnessing others go through persecution and suffering while rejoicing encourages boldness and a reason to stay the course and to glorify God in any circumstance. For the unbeliever, it's a testament to the genuineness of our faith, and therefore the realness of our God. It brings proof to our witness of God's faithfulness when we show that we believe his word and we're able to say, as Paul does in the midst of his persecution, for to me, is, for to, me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which... I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. When seen in this light, persecution, suffering persecution for the sake of the gospel that we are convinced has brought us something far greater than our earthly comforts is something to rejoice in. And I'm convinced that when we draw near to Christ in our suffering, he's present with us 
in a, in a truly supernatural, unique way. And we're given a, a supernatural measure of grace to not only endure, but to rejoice. To be a citizen of the kingdom of God brings both privilege and it brings responsibility. Our citizenship has been given to us as a gift. This gift cost us nothing. It was earned for us by Christ, who's our king. There's no other kingdom like it. No other king more worthy than King Jesus. What king would sacrifice so much to make the unworthy worthy? Who would suffer humiliation and death on behalf of his subjects? There is no king like Christ. So in response to our citizenship, we're to live worthy of it. Never to earn it or pay it back. We could never do that. But in gratitude for it. As citizens, we're united in a radical way in the gospel of faith. We are fearless, a fearless witness to a desperate world. And we embrace our salvation and our suffering, both as gifts from God that draw us closer to him and bring in an undeniable witness of the worthiness of our king. So let me ask you, are you a good citizen? It's impossible without the grace of God. Our salvation is impossible. Living out the Christian life is impossible, but for the grace of God. We're not only saved from something, death, but we're saved to something, eternal life now, beginning now. So if you're a Christian, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. You are radically united with other believers in the Holy Spirit, in the gospel of faith. You have no need to fear those who oppose you because you have a resurrection hope, an eternal assurance. The war has been won and you are on the winning side. No matter what it looks like in the moment, you have a mission, you have purpose, even in suffering. You have kingdom work to do in response to all that God has done for you in sealing your eternal citizenship. If you fail to live this way, which we all do, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. It's that easy. We can repent and be cleansed in that very moment to walk in righteousness and faith for the glory of God, to walk boldly, fearlessly, united, as citizens of the eternal kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.